Buongiorno. So I'm Nick Sabo, and today I'm going to show you some of the people behind the innovations and the ideas and the dreams that I believe influenced the dawn of Bitcoin. And that's going to include some economic and political ideas and some technological ideas. So the outline is I'm going to start with some brief observations about the origin and history of and nature of money to give some context. And then I will go in a little bit more length about the innovators and how their innovations are used in Bitcoin. So I was as uh, part of this uh, big effort back in the 1990s, I was inspired to do a deep dive into the origins and nature of money. And so I'm going to give you, um, since that, that form some of the background here. I'm going to give a brief uh, background of that. Um, so shell beads in the archaeological record date back many tens of thousands of years. Um, all we have is the objects. We can't be sure of what they were used for. But we can observe some societies more recently um, in uh, exploration in colonial times and to some extent even right up to today. Um, we do have some good information about what beads were used for then. Um, and by implication, probably much further back in, in history. Um, wealth transfers for injury compensation, peacemaking as a part of, um, as wealth transfer during marriage and after death, uh, for example, inheritance. Um, so the store of value function was generally more important than transaction convenience. Um, transactions were um, ex expensive to validate before the uh, dawn of coinage. And modern personal finance isn't as radically different from that as it may seem. Economists talk about market this and market that, but a lot of us are, most of us are saving for things like retirement, for marriage, family, buying our first home, our children's education, legacy for our children, or other uh, cherished people um, that we leave beyond the grave. And so, um, we do, in fact, even though economists focus on markets and, and large-scale social interactions, money is very crucial even at the, at the family level and wealth in general. And so the origins of money lie not in market transactions, but in this much more local, familial, uh, almost family level, often family level, uh, wealth transfers. And uh, so... Even for Bitcoin, I would say the store of value function is really what's fundamental and the liquid markets are helpful but not necessary. Most, the vast majority of attention goes to liquid markets. But I believe from studying the origins of money that the, the core functionality is really the, the store of value and the local familial transfer function. Um, so the oldest surviving legal code in the world talks about weigh and deliver. There's a lot of different theories about what money is, the nature of money, and so forth. But I think if you look at the actual documents and take them fairly literally, way and deliver is not about some abstract debt or something. It's not about um, some abstract financial exchange or promises. It's about silver here. It's about weighing and delivering a specific quantity of a specific substance called silver. And that's what they considered money, and other stuff was fake. And so, well, gold was even better than silver, but, but uh, stuff that was not unforgeably costly uh, was not regarded as money. Um, it might be recorded as a debt. It might, for some circumstances, in a book entry, be considered as good as um, the thing. But the fundamental unit that people wanted was, was the silver or the gold. And further back, you know, sh things like shell beads, other unforgeable costly things. And uh, this is, there's also a tablet here recording the expenses of a traveling salesman. So this is somewhat smaller transactions. So they're in copper and acquired small wares for a value of four shekels of silver. And that this, this is pre-coinage. There's no such thing as coins during this era. So um, to try to make it as, as unspoofable and easy to validate as possible before the invention of coinage, you had things like these spiral forms that you could clip at a random point and you could put the silver over a fire and if it glowed the right color then you knew it was good silver. 
But needless to say, your everyday real transactions, you're, you're probably not gonna do that too often. This is for somewhat more valuable transactions. Um, and this became a global form of money. Here's the 17th century silver network. As silver spread around the world, it was transformed into a variety of different objects. Um, here's the Spanish gold bullion and the Spanish coins. These uh, wire things, similar to the spiral money, but in different shapes, were uh, among the most common things used in the Indian Ocean, most common form of money in the Indian Ocean area. And uh, that's a Chinese Saisi um, silver ingot. They're all made out of the, the uh, shared global form of money, which is silver, but they all, all also have their different local, local variations. So the key feature of almost ancient, all ancient forms of money from shell beads to the gold behind the gold standard, which at least technically was in, in force until 1971, so you know 99.9% .9 of uh, recorded history, um, was unforgeable costliness. No entity anywhere could just make it out of thin air. It took some collecting, in the case of shell beads, for example, or some um, mining, in the case of gold and silver, to bring new units into being. And you don't have to make something concretely useful, like a power plant or something in order to have something economically useful, but like an insurance policy. Insurance policy doesn't have to start out as something other than insurance policy. So even though money could and probably did in, in many cases evolve from useful objects like axes and so forth, um, it, it can also uh, be optimized and designed as money. Um, just like Bitcoin did not start out as just a database or a spreadsheet or anything else except it was designed as a cryptocurrency. And some common features of this form of money for the vast majority of history were unforgeable costliness, durability, and compactness. You could securely store and transport it. <clears throat> and so you can see also there was an evolution from beads to coins. Um, beads became more standardized and can take uh, fungible units um, similar to the units uh, coins uh, made out. All these are made of electrum and then the first coins which is a mix of gold and silver and the first coins also were made out of uh, electrum. And so coins sacrifice trust minimization. I talk about two, two key things. Um, trust minimization, or sometimes called trustlessness, is a slightly exaggerated uh, term for that. And, but coins sacrifice some trust minimization for increased velocity. So it outsourced most validation of the mint. Um, of course, mints have abused this over the centuries and debased coinage at various times. And, um, but the, the advantage was increased velocity, that now you could use it for lower value market transactions and for things like paying taxes, which is why the government loved it, why governments took over the mints usually. And some of the same crafts and skills, but, but this, this comes at a cost and it tended to degrade over time, and especially during the Industrial Revolution, there was all sorts of attacks successfully made against the various forms of money in the world, including coins. Um, here's a counterfeit coin from uh, the Industrial Revolution, it's a fake silver dollar made in, Spanish silver dollar, made in Birmingham, England by a technique learned in nearby in Sheffield. So the Industrial Revolution era techniques applied to uh, uh, counterfeiting money. And of course, nation states were happy to counterfeit against each other. They would hang you if you tried to counterfeit their currency, but they were great counterfeiting other people, so. Um, Banknotes, uh, further increase the trust um, because of some of the uh, insecurity of, of possession and uh, some other factors, um, expensive validation. Um, there was further centralization, further increase of trust or vulnerability um, when banknotes came into being. And gold came to be held in centralized vaults and IOUs um, for much more than the gold actually held were issued, called fractional reserve banking. And uh, so the risks and, and the trust in this system tended to increase over time. And so eventually they defaulted on this with the, the Bank of England in 1931 and a partial default by the US in 1933. 
And then the final uh, default um, away from the gold standard in 1971 where they repudiated the promise to uh, pay these notes in gold. And now it's just fiat. It's just the paper itself is the bunny. And uh, it, we have electronic I and it's not even dominated by the paper anymore. It's electronic IOUs for worthless paper that used to be <laughs> a debt for gold, but no longer is. So that, that's the, the actual legal structure of our, our modern money. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the, even though the dollar bill looks very similar to what it looked like before 1971, it's actually a very, very different thing legally and legally. <clears throat> so Bitgold was the first cryptocurrency proposal and design um, along with the <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And um, tokens based on proof of work and securely decentralized based on um, consensus and Merkle trees. Um, as I'll describe on the LibTech list, kind of B money and Bitgold developed, developed kind of in, in parallel. And so uh, that, was, that was kind of the Annus Meribilis uh, 1998 for, uh, for a cryptocurrency. And uh, secure property titles was the first proposal to tokenize assets. Um, and it was also the basis for my Bitcoin design, and I'll describe some of that. And then RPOW was the first cryptocurrency system um, using trusted hardware. Um, since it's centralized, some people might not define it as a cryptocurrency, but um, and it has some weaknesses. For example, it could shut down and go out of business, and your tokens would be gone. But um, it did use um, trusted hardware to trust minimize. Um, some of the other aspects, like the ability of the, the, the central server to counterfeit and stuff like that. So there were a whole bunch of computer science breakthroughs that were necessary to make uh, Bitcoin possible as well. And uh, here are some of them. Public key cryptography, cryptographic hash functions, Merkle trees, secure time stamping, Byzantine consensus, and uh, a breakthrough of that, a probabilistic Byzantine consensus is uh, most akin to what, what Bitcoin uh, does. And uh, that was a breakthrough then. And uh, proof of work, <coughs> so I'll go over most of these. Um, so these folks pioneered the study, uh, studying of the cyber war of all against all, or at least one fraction against another. This is uh, Robert Shostak on the left here and Leslie Lamport on the right uh, pioneered this research. And down the bottom here, Michael Ryder and Dahlia Maki came up with a particular probabilistic Byzantine consensus system that I used in secure property titles and, and thus in Bitgold. And this, there was a big flaw in this line of research, though it originated in CPUs wired in place when it was about their reliability. So even though you, Byzantine consensus involved attacks, it was, it was um, certain assumptions were built into this. And so it's based on the bad assumption that you could securely identify and count unique nodes. Um, but on the internet, um, this gives rise to the similar sock puppet problem that you can't really um, securely identify and count unique nodes. Um, and Satoshi with Bitcoin, I did not solve this with Bitgold, Satoshi solved this, came up with a much better approach to this problem that removes this assumption, this weakness in the traditional Byzantine consensus research. And this is Ralph Merkel, a cypherpunk before they coined the term. Cypherpunk before the cypherpunks were born. Um, and he, <laughs> and, and, uh, he invented probably most of modern cryptography, or at least he came up with the initial ideas uh, for them. And um, so he, he uh, came up with um, the first version of public key cryptography that was outside the intelligence agencies. He invented cryptographic hashes and Merkle trees, which were used in Bitcoin. And he did all that in the 1970s when he was in high school and college. And later he became a proponent of some ideas similar to the extropians, which I'll talk about. Um, but he was not directly involved. He was an earlier generation, so he was not directly involved with the extropians or the cypherpunks. But in the 1990s, he became focused on nanotechnology and cryonics. So very extropian ideas, but uh, <laughs> off in his own world there. Um, so, this is uh, Ralph Merkel and Martin Hellman and Whitfield Diffie. Uh, could have been the three inventors of public key cryptography. The first version of that outside the intelligence agencies was uh, Merkle puzzles, which were a 
based on quadratic rather than super polynomial difficulty. So quadratic means something like x squared, where a super polynomial would be something of the x power. And uh, so the super polynomial difficulty just grows much faster. And so a secure public key cryptography function today would quadratic wouldn't be considered secure and super polynomial is what we would like. But he did invent the first first version of it, even though it wasn't the strongest version. And so he came up with the initial idea for public key cryptography in, in the public domain outside the intelligence agencies in the first place. And um, so Hellman and Martin Hellman and Whit Diffie here invented um, a super polynomial version, um, the discrete logarithm problem. Now, Bitcoin also uses a discrete logarithm thing called ESDSA uh, signatures to prove who controls your Bitcoin, um, whose keys control your Bitcoin. Hopefully, your keys control your Bitcoin, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Anyway, that, that Bitcoin makes that possible, EC, uh, the discrete logarithm problem that uh, Hellman and Dippy uh, pioneered make that possible. And uh, we also added, um, well, Bitcoin people also added Schnorr signatures recently um, with the Taproot upgrade that's also based on the discrete log problem. And uh, also invented by uh, Dr. Merkel, um, cryptographic hashes. And so one cryptographic function, the hash function acts like a checksum. The difference is that the numbers it adds up to are binary digits that make up the text, images, or other data. Um, and another difference is that with one-way functions and very large numbers, it can be much more secure than a normal checksum. And cryptographic cache functions of lesser difficulty can also be used for proof of work, which I'll discuss shortly. And another thing you can do with public key cryptography is digital signatures. And this is how Bitcoin proves that, again, that your keys are that you control your Bitcoin, that your, you have the keys that control your Bitcoin by a digital signature without revealing what the key is. And you can think of this as akin to um, data sealed. Um, in ancient Mesopotamia, in the ancient world, they had cl used clay to seal jars, to seal documents, to seal all sorts of things. And then you would rub your seal cylinder on it. You had a unique seal cylinder that was your own that you can consider that equivalent to your, to your private key in, in Bitcoin and it would leave, leave this unique mark. And if the seal was unbroken, you knew not only that the stuff hadn't been tampered with, in the, in the case of Bitcoin, you know that your, your Bitcoin on the public blockchain hasn't been tampered with, but uh, you also, and everybody who validates, everybody who runs a full node can validate, can tell this. Um, and you also know it's controlled by your keys and not somebody else's. And in this case, you know it was made by whoever had that that cylinder, that unique cylinder, and not somebody else. So Merkle trees. Merkle also invented a structure of cryptographic hashes called Merkle trees. And these are created from the bottom up. Um, computer scientists think of trees upside down. So the leaves are at the bottom and the roots at the top. So, <laughs> um, so it starts with leaves at the bottom. Each layer gets cryptographically hashed until you reach a top hash or root, root hash. And that, that's your compact summary of all the transaction data in the tree. The root hash represents the leaves in the tree. It's basically a secure checksum of all the leaves. If you change the data in one leaf, it changes the cryptographic hash of all the parents in the Merkle tree, including the root hash. And so this is used in Bitcoin um, <coughs> to summarize all the data and all the transactions in a particular block. So that's a key part of efficiently verifying that all the transactions in the block are valid or detecting if one or more of them are, are invalid and should be rejected. If the block should be rejected. And indeed, we can look at the Bitcoin validation uh, system as a big warning system, a very thorough auditing that warns full nodes when something is not quite right, in which the node rejects those batches of, of transactions. And the Merkle trees and the cryptographic caches in there, both invented by Ralph Merkle, are, are key to doing that. <clears throat> and so you can think of the Merkle tree as trapping transactions in an immutable record like flies trapped in amber. So by contrast, the traditional database is kind of like Etch-a-Sketch. Whoever controls the server 
that has the database can revise or erase its, <coughs> its data at will. Whereas an immutable blockchain, that, that's not possible. All, all, you know, we have thousands of full nodes validating, checking to see if any of the data has been tampered with. And so now I'll talk a little bit about proof of work, another key part of Bitcoin. Um, this is uh, Cynthia Dwork and Mani Noir were the uh, first inventors of proof of work. And uh, Adam Back was an independent inventor who implemented a thing, uh, version called Hashcash. Um, he was running a remailer, uh, a Chamian digital mix, which I'll talk about David Chom shortly. And he was worried about spam because these are anonymous. They can't do the typical um, anti-spam measure blacklisting senders. So he designed and encoded a, a, a posted scheme, a use once proof of work called Hashcash. Um, calling it cash was a little bit optimistic, but he was dreaming hopefully of more than, than just uh, one-time use postage, but that's what he implemented. That was his main motivation. Um, and so I, I also used Hashcash in my Bitgoal design and how Finney would use it in reusable <coughs> proofs of work. And uh, now it's used in Bitcoin. And so Hashcash repeatedly hashes data and over and over with tiny variations until a hash is found with a certain number of leading zeros. And um, the hash collisions are hard to compute but easy to verify. And with proof of work, you, you set the difficulty, set the difficulty level of it. So a traditional cryptographic hash, as Ralph Merkel envisioned it, um, it's too hard to solve. You can't solve it practically, so it makes it super secure. But in this case, we want people to solve it. We just want it to be specific, have a specific cost involved. And so Bitcoin security, um, based on Satoshi's breakthrough, is based in part on the reasonable assumption that, that it's partly based on this assumption that Bitcoin miners won't waste money to submit invalid blocks. And the other big thing that, that proof of work um, brings that I think is, is under underestimated is uh, unforgeable costliness. Um, a string of difficult to compute um, bits can be compared to gold atoms that are costly to mine or shell beads that are costly to collect and turn into beads and to rare postage stamps that are costly for collectors to search long enough to, to find them. And, and from studying history, I can tell you this is the basis of what most, most money has been based on this. Um, and I wrote a short paper on proof of work in 1999 called Intrapolynomial Cryptography. Um, and I guess it's a good time to point out also, oh, so one of the key takeaways of that is um, proof of work schemes are fundamentally dependent on computer architecture. Um, if you can make breakthroughs in computer architecture, for example, A6, then you can greatly um, increase the efficiency of your mining and beat your competitors. And of course, that's what we've seen in the, the Bitcoin market is the, the people with the clever hardware uh, uh, come to dominate Bitcoin miners. <clears throat> and so uh, another thing to, to point out uh, about Bitcoin, it's good to point out here, is that the long-term security or proof of work depends on the relative computing power rather than proportional long-term increases in computing power. So long as the attacker's computing power is getting reduced along with the uh, protectors, it doesn't really matter if there's a big reduction in the, in, the, in the cryptographic hash power of Bitcoin. I mean, it started out with very low hash power, right? And it wasn't all that insecure back then either. So um, it depends on the relative computing power of the attacker, which is in part based on, on what they have to gain and how big the Bitcoin network is, how more valuable it is. Um, rather than just on the Bitcoin's computing power itself, the hash power. Okay, so a couple ideas that were particularly interesting um, as far as political and economic inspirations um, go with the uh, cypherpunks and particularly with the extropian um, branch of cypherpunks, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, Galt's Gulch in cyberspace was an idea of, of Ayn Rand's idea of Galt's Gulch combined with uh, Tim May's um, visions and dreams of that in cyberspace and Austrian economics and depoliticized money. So in 1976, um, the last big bout we had with inflation, 
um, a Nobel Prize winning economist named Frederick Hayek wrote the denationalization of money and he envisioned um, privately issued money, um, competing currencies, but the technology just wasn't there, especially in terms of, of trust <coughs> minimization and just in terms of people remembering what money had been before fiat took over. Um, the technology just wasn't there um, to make any form of money without asking permission of the existing governments and financial institutions. So uh, it, was, it was a great, great dream by a, a great economist, but it, it remained a dream for a while. Um, and th this is a book that inspired me in particular. Um, Roy Davies, A History of Money. It was a very non-ideological book. It didn't go to weird banks weird lengths to make gold or shell beads or so on sound arbitrary like fiat currency. These are, gold and shell beads are based on unforgeable costliness and some other desiderata that are very concrete. They're not arbitrary at all. So the whole ideology of, oh, money is arbitrary and you can use whatever nonsense you want is a complete fiat currency, fake money ideology. Like money can just be fake is essentially what that ideology is. And this is very, very wrong. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> this, book, <laughs> this book inspired me to do a deeper dive into the origins and nature of money, some of the results I described in earlier slides in this talk, and you can read in depth more about this in my essay, Shelling Out, um, which is available on the web. And oh, by the way, the Nakamoto Institute, it's, it's there, and it has about all, most of the other stuff, uh, the, all the stuff I'm gonna give links to is available in the, uh, at the Nakamoto Institute website. They have a great, great collection of, of historical stuff from this era. Um, and so Galtz Gulch um, was Ayn Rand's vision. Um, she was a novelist and, and philosopher of libertarian bent in the middle 20th century. And it was basically a community of free markets that um, used some quasi-magic technology to protect itself from outside interference. Um, and so it was a libertarian playground uh, free from outside interference and it it's secured from outside interference. Well, so even though it was a fantasy, it basically inspired, it inspired a lot of people to think about how could we actually implement something like this. And one of these people especially was Tim May, and he came up with the vision of Galtz Gulch and cyberspace. And the cl his uh, claim was that you can really secure free markets from outside interference using cryptography, and he called this concept crypto anarchy. Uh, still utopian, but much less technologically unrealistic than the original Gold Gulch. And it was a great starting point for creative inspiration. If, even if you're not libertarian, don't care about uh, the ideology, um, it's just a great creative starting point for uh, coming up with ideas of your own and implementing independent things that are independent from the existing institutions rather than having to go on your hands and knees and beg to a bank, oh, can I have access to the dollar because I want my things to be in dollars, which was what uh, the other, other people implementing digital, digital payment systems at this time were doing. <clears throat> um, so when I inspired me and, me and uh, Wei Dai and others and Hal Finney, and I'll get to that, but, um, but when I did Bitgold, it, I wanted to be completely independent, not dependent on banks like, for example, Chiming Cash, which I'll get to, uh, was dependent on banks. And the fact that can Bitcoin can operate in a seamlessly global way now, um, I believe comes from this idea of Galt Gulch in cyberspace. It's not dependent for its security or its functionality on the current legal system. It's decentralized, it's trust minimized. And so you can seamlessly send Bitcoin from El Salvador to Togo, from any country to any other country. You don't have to permission, ask permission of El Salvador, Togo, or anybody in between, you send it on Bitcoin network. And that is uh, just radically different from what the other, other people in the 1990s and earlier were envisioning for digital um, technology. So uh, another big inspiration was um, Austrian economists who wanted to privatize money. They wanted to depoliticize money. Um, they emphasized the importance of property and contracts. So uh, Frederick Hayek won a Nobel Prize in economics in the 70s for explaining business cycles and inflation. And he'd probably have interesting th things to say about the inflation going on today. Um, Hayek was also an advocate of private, non-governmental money. He hoped for a roundabout way to do it, but it, unfortunately it didn't exist in his, his time. 
So uh, these ideas coalesced around two, two groups that, that I was involved in, um, the extropians and the cypherpunks. Um, the extropians were libertarian futurist interested in the intersection of um, Ayn Rand and Mur Murray Rothbard and Frederick Hayek, so the latter two of those uh, Austrian economists, um, and high technology. And the cypherpunks wanted to free cryptography from government control and make it a tool for masses, and they were in very interested in privacy. Privacy for the masses, not just for intelligence agencies. And so uh, while Bitcoin does not owe a direct technological debt to uh, Chaumian cash or to mixes invented by this uh, really smart guy, David Chaum, uh, who, was, who was more of the generation of uh, Whit Diffie and, and Ralph Merkel and Martin Hillman and so forth, the, the, the pioneers of the, of the modern cryptographic space. Um, he did give it just enormous uh, inspiration to the cypherpunks. And so all the early cypherpunks uh, proposals for uh, digital money were, were based on Xiaomi and cash. And they implemented a, a system of their own called uh, Xiaomi's company called eCash. Um, it was centralized. It would have to rely on banks for back-end back features like auditing to protect against embezzlement or overissue. Um, and when the company went out of business, it was shut down. People couldn't use eCash anymore. So those are two pretty big weaknesses, but a big strength, which actually Bitcoin doesn't have, it was you could do private transactions, um, untraceable transactions in it. And kind of the, the somewhat unfortunate thing with technology is you can either have extremely private, untraceable transactions, or you can have almost fully public um, transactions. It's hard to get in between without introducing trust and uh, legal mechanisms and so forth. <clears throat> so unfortunately, to some extent, we've, we've chosen the, uh, you know, fully transparent, fully public stuff, and it's much harder to do private stuff today than it used to be with uh, physical cash, for example, or gold and silver. Um, it did have some useful trust minimization features. Um, now, in order to test this system, they actually invented a play currency called Cyberbunks, or at least they envisioned it as a, as a play currency at the time. They encouraged people to set up little web shops that took Cyberbunks, and they implemented a gambling um, application that actually paid out a little bit more than people put in. It was a way to get people using it and, and distribute the, the technology and the money. Um, so Cyberbucks, you could call that the first uh, private digital currency. I wouldn't call it a cryptocurrency in the modern sense because it was just so radically different in its design from what um, Bitcoin and B-Money and uh, Bitcoin um, became. But it, it was, in, in some sense, the first digital private currency, even though it was, it was um, meant as a toy currency. It kind of took on a life of its own. But unfortunately, the, the company shut down and and the server shut down, and that was the end of the Cyberbucks experiment. So uh, the Extropians were some libertarian futurists whose heyday was about the mid-1990s. And this is a cover of their magazine from 1999, and it says, Virtual Bank of Extropolis, Distributed Networks of Extropia. So it's a hypothetical digital currency called the Hayek. And uh, it's not clear whether this was centralized around a bank, because they talk about themselves it as being a bank or part of a bank, or decentralized, as the term distributed network suggests, and in 1995 with the extropians, this was kind of at the hand-waving stage, but this is what extropians wanted to build, so didn't quite know how to do it yet, but that's what they wanted to do. And here's an article uh, I wrote in Extra Magazine from 1995 on smart contracts. That's a different subject for another day. <laughs> uh. So I had uh, an email list in the middle to late 1990s called LibTech. And the key participants were veterans of both the Extropians and the Cypherpunks mailing lists. And uh, some of the participants here shown are Wei Dai and Hal Finney and Tim May. <coughs> and uh, out of this discussion um, between ourselves um, and some other people came my ideas for Bitgold, Wei Dai's ideas for B-Money, and uh, I call this kind of the Annus Mirabilis of, of 1998 is when something starting to resemble Bitcoin uh, started appearing in people's minds. And uh, 
So we wanted to apply computer science to depoliticize money, and you could call this the extropian wing of the cypherpunks if, if you like. Um, discipline daydreaming at the intersection of politics and technology, and computer science and the, the modern cryptography, which Ralph Merkel had such a big um, role in, in inventing, um, gives us far more leverage to change the world than really any other study in our age. And so we were, we were taking advantage of it. We were on the internet in still somewhat early days of the internet where you could find the people who are interested in what you were interested in. So we'd found each other and we started talking and, and uh, we had some uh, great ideas back in the day. So anyway, cash, cash, uh, lacked a trust minimized way of uh, tracking ownership. So what, one, of the, one of the parts of Bitgold that you can also look at as a, as a separate entity in and of itself was uh, secure property titles. And so Hashcash lacked a trust minimized way of tracking ownership, which meant that participants could only generate proofs of work on the fly. You had to have a um, centralized server to, uh, to track uh, who, who could use them. Um, and the participants before Al Finney implemented his RPAP, participants could not save their wealth in, in the form of proofs of work. Um, so secure property titles was a solution to the problem of how to handle a uh, proof of work string or other pieces of property. Proof of work was, was one, and Bitgold was one application of these. So that the owner could prove when it was created and continue to prove exclusive ownership of it. And so it used public keys and digital signatures as the ultimate identifiers of an entity. So everything is claimed as property by public keys, whoever, not your key, not your property. Um, anyone who wants to stake a claim or prepare to receive a transfer of property can obtain a public-private key pair uh, from their own software and uh, receive that now Bitcoin, but other kinds of property as well back then. And I talked a little bit uh, about um, property governance and, and forks. Um, I called the governance property clubs because it really, in a context of, of a cryptocurrency or something like Bitcoin or B money, um, you're really interested in the property rights and securing the property rights. The, the institution you have has a specific goal. It's not just some generic government. And so I call them property clubs just to, to focus on what the goal should be for secure property titles. And because they're not fully trust minimized, um, there really a need for some residual, they're, they're not fully trustless. And Bitcoin isn't fully trustless either. It comes a lot closer than anything else, but uh, not, not fully trustless. Um, there remained a need for residual governance, a property club whose purpose is to maintain that correct title registry um, everything the protocol couldn't do, um, they would do, and with low entry and exit costs. And so, and then I talked about forks, where the most basic resource for a subset of observers that, that uh, doesn't agree with a certain um, way of doing things is to establish a new, a new branch, a new set of property titles with their own version of it and advertise its correctness and try to prove or argue for the incorrectness of the rival group. <clears throat> so uh, now I come to Bitgold. And again, this was uh, um, one, of the, one of the things I was striving for is trust minimization. But the other thing that, that I've talked less about, but I'll, I'll focus on it here, is unforgeable costliness. And that is beads and silver Coils, gold coins, rear posted stamps, the things that have been used as, as uh, money, what they had in common, and also collectibles uh, in general, they have in common unforgeable costliness. And so that is what I aspired to design with Bitgold, a money based on unforgeably costly creation. It could have been called bit beads or bit stamps or et cetera, but I, ca I called it Bitgold because gold's the most obvious analogy to make and the highest quality form of physical and forgeable costliness compared to. And I also used the phrase bit gold miner, so that was the first uh, use of that metaphor. And the goal of security or trust minimization, we want have, I wanted to have the security and trust minimization of silver and gold plus the convenience of digital money. I wanted to have the unforgeable costliness. And so I had tokens based on proof of work 
plus the secure the secure property titles, the secure decentralization based on Byzantine consensus. And now it turns out that second part, the secure property titles, uh, Satoshi greatly improved upon that by incorporating the proof of work into the consensus mechanism. So that's kind of the biggest difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin is that Satoshi came up with that breakthrough. And you can also think of this as making the proof of works reusable, and that's what, how Hal Finney looked at it. Um, he would later come up with his own much simpler cryptocurrency called reusable proofs of work, or RPOW for short. And Wei Dai also came up at that time with B money, and I can't really do justice. I apologize for this with a proper explanation, but uh, I do encourage everybody to go out and read. Um, again, the Nakamoto Institute has his uh, document, his paper that he posted on B money that you can go read. <coughs> And so now we come to what I consider probably to be the first implemented cryptocurrency is uh, RPOW, and that was done by Hal Finney. And he was a regular poster to Extropians and Cypherpunks in the LibTech list. And he designed and implemented the first, you know, what I consider the first cryptocurrency of RPOW. And so that stands for Reusable Proofs of Work. Um, one of his inspirations for that was Bitgold. And he used a special hardware to have an efficient centralized solution. So it's not quite as bad as it sounds. It was actually pretty interesting, but um, in part because people didn't really understand or trust that, that hardware. Um, and in part because some of the weakness of centralization, such as his, his business such down, shuts down, the whole thing shuts down, is um, it, was, it was ended up being less interesting to people than Bitcoin would be. Um, but it was also considerably simpler than, than Bitgold as well. <coughs> so hash cash was an important part of RPOW. Um, and, yeah. and so Hal would go on to uh, be an early Bitcoin contributor and commentator. And uh, he received the first Bitcoin transaction from Satoshi. And the rest, as they say, is history. Thank you. I think I have time for two or three short questions within the scope of this before Satoshi history. So nothing about Satoshi or later. Thank you. Um, OK. Yeah. Do you think that Bitcoin the way it was created was technically uh, complete, i.e., what could have been done better? And is it at risk? Oh, yeah, oh, well, that's a question from afterwards, but um, <laughs> after study, but it, it is surprisingly complete. It, it just considered a bunch of um, attacks and stuff, and it's stood the test of time so far. So, it, yeah, it, it was surprisingly complete, much more than, than our designs or our power. Yeah. Could you give a little bit light on the working mode that you had in the time? Was this mostly personal meetings? Was it important to be in the same place at the same time? Did you have like uh, email mailing lists? Or yeah, it was dominated by mailing lists. So that was, we did have a few face to face interactions. Um, but like, for example, I, heard, I, I met Hal Finney a few times. I never met Wei Dai. I met Tim May a lot, but probably Wei Dai and Hal Finney were the more important people to interact so with. So. Okay, one more question. <laughs> Just for clarity, one of the slides, you mentioned uh, Bitcoin is having an element of trust here on one of the slides. What's the, uh, the element? Oh, 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 yeah. uh, well, the element of trust, one of the elements of trust is a uh, fork, the, the ability of people to change your rules and fork. And so you might not agree with all the rules of a particular fork, but you're going to have to choose one of them. So that's an element of trust. One more question. How do you feel about lagging network right now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>